Hello, everybody. Um, is that big enough for people to see? It looks very small from here for some reason. Looks okay, but you could surely maximize the browser. Um, up my end, you mean? Yeah, like F11 or something. Um, it's because I'm using a slightly lower resolution screen. Bear with me a second. I just changed screens. I might be able to make this bit bit better. Um, bear with me one sec. Let me do this again. Now again, that's still small. Um, I don't know why that's small. Is it small for everyone or just for me? It looks fine from here, Alan. Does it? Okay, well, I'll continue then because it looks big enough on my other screen. <laughs> so, um, what I want to talk about uh, today is what we've been working on um, and what we have um, coming very soon. We've actually finished most of the work on the hardware side. We haven't finished all the work on the software side, strangely. But um, I wanted to go through just a bit of history, and I just want to quickly cover here. I'm going. To, I'm using now the because it's written in Markdown. I'm just going to use the uh, GitHub page. It's probably easiest. The, there's a link at the end if anyone needs to go onto the uh, repository where you can see this. Um, basically, I want to cover where did this come from, some of the history. Some of the things that we've worked on that have led to this. Um, what are the key elements? Um, what is the purpose? What are we trying to solve uh, with the new boards? Uh, where does this lead to? And um, maybe give you an indication of um, when you can get your hands on these and actually start um, playing around. Um, so quickly, I guess the uh, um, the history of what's led to black to uh, Black Edge. Um, in 2016 at uh, Oshkamp, we released um, the original MyStorm slash Black Ice One board um, after uh, a short conversation between uh, Ken Boak and myself uh, at one of the uh, Oshug meetings. And um, we decided that we're going to make a new FPGA board to support the open source tools, um, primarily uh, Claire Zen's Yosis uh, or iStorm was a collection name at the time for the set of FPGA tools, the open source FPGA tools. Um, the picture you're looking at here is actually the one that came after. This was the second version that actually came in about uh, 2017, 20, no, it was 2017. We made a few small changes about microcontroller choices, but the actual Lattice ICE 40 chip has kind of been at its heart since the very start. Um, this one had Arduino shield headers on, as well as a kind of half Raspberry Pi header in the old days where 26 pins. And then you see PMODs around the outside, and that was the main connectivity method. Uh, but PMODs aren't... Um, always um, the best thing. So if you use a PMOD, you'll be familiar with these sort of end-on connectors. Here I've got a PMOD connected to one of the newer boards. But what you get with this is they kind of flap in the wind a bit. They're not mechanically very sound. They're quite good electrically. But if you want to use them and in anything that has vibration or if you want to use them in a robot or something like that, then they're really not very good. And the more you use them, the, the looser they get and the worse the connectivity gets. So they're great because you can pick up the modules, but they're not so good when it comes to actually using them. Um, and that was something I was very aware of. Um, and in trying to actually improve on this, one of the things that I did in the early days was I built a board that actually sat on top of the Black Eyes 2. If you look carefully, sorry, I'll go back to this. You can see some holes in the board um, and the nearest side here uh, in front of the three double P mods. And those holes can actually contain another connector that can point to this, which is exactly what I used to create this board that sits on top of 
the original Black Eyes 2. This was for a project which was doing, um, it was actually driving, it was to do with some camera uh, number plate recognition systems. And one of the things that we had to do was drive some quite high powered stuff, including the infrared flash system. Um, and that little board there you see in the top right hand corner is like a daughter board that can sit in the top. That was responsible for generating the uh, higher currents and higher voltages uh, required in order to deliver the infrared. Um, uh, it was actually a very large set of infrared LEDs to give that enough power. So this was a good little thing and I could put other kind of daughter boards on here. Um, and it was kind of the first attempt I had at thinking, well, how can we have an FPGA and a microcontroller and how can we expand that in a way that's a bit more mechanically stable and also deal with things like carrying higher voltage out. Uh, as you can see, this one got a bit um, actually um, damaged when I resoldered some things. You can see some melting going on on some of the uh, headers uh, for that. That's just my clumsy soldering. But how do you get higher power in here? And when I'm talking about higher power in these case, you know, when you're driving things like um, infrared LEDs or maybe motors or actuators and things like that, quite often you might need to go up to say, 24 volts or something, and you might want to, uh, you know, several amps of power. So you need to have a way of distributing that power to these small boards that can then do the driving on the actuators, etc. And that was what 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 I did with this, and that kind of led me to think, well, how can we do this, you know, in a more organised fashion? Um, after the Black Ice Two, we brought out the Black Ice MX, and this was a two-part board. So um, I can show you on the camera here, the, these are the two parts. So this board here is, has got um, actually mixed mods on it, and I'll explain that in a second. They, they are an extension of P-mods. So that like uh, breaks out the I.O. And then the brains, if you like, with the FPGA and the uh, STM32 and some memory, at least it's on a smaller card, along with the USB, etc., for programming. And then this actually resides, that fits on that clips onto the board on the top here um, to give you the Black Ice MX. Um, but it was designed in a way to be more than just a board that could connect to mix mods. Um, just to explain quickly what the difference is. So this is a mix mod. They're very similar to P mods. Um, normally P mods you have a gap in the middle. So this is like a double P mod, but it's got some extra pins in the middle, which we use for mix signal because most PMODs don't support the mix signal analog signals, uh, which is why these came about. Now, the other thing that you could do as well as doing PMODs is you could build a different kind of carrier altogether. So this was a carrier that I designed for educational purposes. Um, so again, this has two big mix mods at the top uh, and a small half mix mod at the bottom. And then, included actually on the carrier board you get a seven segment uh display uh you get an audio output and you get a vga display as well um you find a lot of demonstrations when people are learning things like verilog etc um these are great kind of starter projects um driving seven segment displays you know it's probably one of the most uh common uh, Verilog starting examples, driving audio and driving VGA is another good one. And the VGA is particularly good, although it's a bit more difficult nowadays because not so many people have VGA monitors that uh, they can use. But the point here is that carrier would accept the same uh, board that the Black Ice MX did, i.e. the Ice Storm uh, brain, if you like. Um, so the next stage really was, well, can, can we actually do something with that? Can we have a more ro kind of um, a more robust construction rather than a P mod? Can we have something that you know you can screw in that has better connectors and can possibly tessellate with other tiles um, and provide a nice uh, suitable mechanical structure? Um, so here you see a, a tile. Um, in terms of size, just so that you can see the dimension, here's a, a PCB of a tire that I've got next to my hand. Uh, they're not particularly big. In fact, if you look at the old 
carry uh, the ice core board from the MX. It's about the same size as one of those. They're actually, um, they're not quite 50 by 50, but uh, they're a little bit smaller than that. Um, so I started working on this and the first thing I thought is I can take the um, ice core and build a breakout board for it that contains these tiles. And that's how I started exploring the possibility of doing tiles. Um, so this was really just an ice core breakout. To an, they weren't available generally, but I used this to actually explore the possibility of creating tiles to see what that would look like. Um, pretty soon that led to um, the first kind of prototype of this new tile system. I also have one here uh, physically as well. That's the very same one you see in the picture there. And um, what you see here is that uh, you have the tiles being placed on the quadrants here. Uh, this one supported up to five tiles. And then the brains was actually on the carrier board in this case. So we've got the FPGA in the center. Um, there was some hyper RAM uh, on this original one, some spy flash. Sorry, the, the uh, microcontroller is the big one that you see at the bottom there. The FPGA is a bit higher up. It's actually a BGA package. Um, the reason I'm using the BGA package is uh, yes, you guessed it, chip supply problems. It was the only one I could get. We couldn't actually, if we wanted to, make the original uh, ice cores anymore because you just cannot get the uh, the um, TQFP uh, 144s. So uh, I'm using an FPGA on this particular design here. Now, the biggest problem I had with this, although it was great for trying out the concept, uh, one of the issues was um, it was actually quite a large board and large boards cost a lot more money, particularly if you're doing multi-layer, which I had to do in order to get this to work. Uh, and if you look at the tiles, some of them, like the seven segment here are facing up. And if you look at that, that's sticking what, down or up, uh, which made me realize actually you can put them through the apertures. So if I turn this round, uh, here you can see that we have a VGA connector uh, and that's actually just coming through this aperture. So basically the tile in this case, if you look at it from this angle, you can see the back of the tile. And that would be what I then turn into the bottom of the board. So it actually sits that way up so I can then see this. And that enables us to move on to the um, the newer version. So the next iteration that I did, I think in 2021, um, this is difficult to see what's going on, but basically underneath uh, the board that you can't see is the FPGA board. And that distributes the signal. And then below you've got the tiles, okay? And then on top of that sits the, what we were calling the mezzanine card at the time. And that contains the um, STM32 uh, processor, microcontroller. And the reason for doing this is because we imagine that you might want to use different microcontrollers and different solutions in different circumstances. Um, so the middle board of that sandwich, many, uh, a couple of folks have commented on, you know, our discussion boards that it's like an Oreo sandwich because the original ones were all black. And, um, you know, you've got the microcontroller or mezzanine control board on top. You've got the FPGA stuff uh, below that that distributes all the signals. And then you've got all the tiles butting up underneath um, to this. Now, what that leads to is um, the uh, latest version that we have here, which you can see at an angle. Um, so now you see the seven segment tile here at the top right, poking up through this aperture. Um, and then you see the VGA uh, connector that was similar as before. And on the bottom here, I've actually got some prototype modules um that happened to have pmod adapters in them so that we could backwardly uh compatibly connect to 
P mods, mix mods, etc. So in this case, we've got one big mix mod on the bottom right and a small P mod, double P mod on the bottom left. Um, and you can also use it as a prototype board. There's also a few funky things going on. So if you look to the right of the board, where it says, you can see some LEDs and it says My Storm LED board. So there's a ex new experimental feature that we've created. Um, where we've created what we call them um, as micro blades and what very small boards that are great for doing things where you don't need power and that sort of thing, but you may want to add an accelerometer or a couple of LEDs, or you may want to use it as an SD card. These are tiny. Um, and we are using the same connectors as the SD card. So let me just remind you what I'm talking about here. So that's, Probably not going to focus very well, but I have an SD card here. This is very small. And then I also have here a um, an LED blade with that same format. And I can't actually get it to focus in very nicely, I'm afraid. But that's what you can see in the image below. Um, on the right hand side so we've got those as well and there's actually several connectors we've got room for in the final version we've actually got room for three different micro blades so we have four tile spaces on the bottom and then four micro blades on the top board as well we also obviously have usb to talk to the microcontroller and we also have a power over usb kind of usb c power delivery system that we're still writing the software for which you can see the usb connector for on the left hand side of that if you were to de de deconstruct this you know oreo sandwich um, then what you find underneath is there is the uh microcontroller board um taken off the top the connectors between that board and the board to the right of it the fpga board is the black edge nxt connector this isn't the same as the previous core to mx board um, it's actually changed slightly to adopt for this new situation and we're calling this black edge nxt and that's kind of how we're we're theming the entire project even though these individual boards have different names on um there's some been some to and froing about names some good bike shedding as you can imagine so the board on the left hand side is the microcontroller board that's got a on in this case it's got an stm 32 f7 uh, running at about 216 megahertz so it's very powerful it has some spi flash for its own purposes um it's got the in this case you can see there's actually five sd sockets now on this original one, four of those were connected to the FPGA to give us blades, and one was connected to the microcontroller, which is just used as a standard SD card or MMC card interface. Uh, and on the final version, you actually have one less, uh, and you have an extra header for some extra pins coming out. And then on the left-hand side of that board, you've got a debug connector as well, so you can use you know, your normal um, SWD, JTAG type connectors. Um, the other thing that you notice on there, if you look at the bottom of that diagram, of that image on the left hand side of the microcontroller board, there are in between the blades, there is a USB connector, which is used to talk to the microcontroller, uh, which in turn controls the FPGA and programs it. In addition, you see two small chips there. Those are small BGA chips that are on a hyperbus, and we have some hyper RAM, about 64 megabits of hyper RAM, and we have 128 megabits of hyper flash. So lots and lots of storage. There's also going to be a version of this that doesn't have hyperbus, but has quad SPI flash and quad SPI RAM. Um, and that has slightly less flash as well. That's going to be in the order of 32 megabits of flash and 64 megabits of RAM, but on a QSPI bus rather than a um, uh hyperbus but if you're excited about using hyperbus this is pretty good um one of our colleagues is here today laurie that's been working away on this he's he, he's got both of those uh working they're not quite optimized yet but he's he's got the hyper hyper ram working with um the amaranth orchard 
uh, SOC. And he's just in the last few days, he's got the hyper hyper flash working as well as the hyper wrap. So that's uh, really cool. I'm really excited by that. The work that Laurie's doing on that. Um, then underneath you have the FPGA board. So on the right hand side here, you can see the components that exist on the FPGA board. There isn't a huge number of them. It's primarily the ICE 40 HX in the center. Uh, in this case, it's as I mentioned before, it's the BDA, BGA version rather than the TQFP version that we had previously. Um, and there's a couple of power components uh, below that for creating, you know, the three volt three and uh, one volt two rails for the FPGA. And then the power delivery um, USB uh, connector there, which will supply up to 20 volts to the tiles for power delivery. There's also an XT30 uh, battery type connector if you want to supply higher current to the tiles, which is not populated in this case, which is available on the left hand side there. And you can see how neatly things like the seven segment tile fit in with the uh, display popping through that little aperture. Um, it also gives room for the um, for the actual headers that you may have that are taller than the distance between the two boards, the tiles below and, and this board. Uh, if you decompose it further and take the tiles off the bottom, you can see what's actually connected on the bottom there. Um, bit bit like the uh, fireman's uh, equipment being decomposed on um, on Twitter. So uh, in this case, we've got a seven segment display, we've got a VGA display, and we've got the prototype slash PMOD, which is a double tile adapter because it covers two tile spaces. So uh, what are the key features um, in summary that we're providing by going this route as opposed to going the PMOD route, for example. So first of all is mechanical stability. These things all screw together. Um, it provides a very robust solution that's good in vibration environments um, and it can take some knocks. Um, it's robust and it's more reliable because of that. The connectivity is very uh, reliable. Um, you've also got stack 3D integration, which buys us some of that headroom for having taller connectors like Ethernet connectors and things. That's why we open the aperture there to allow for those taller connections. Um, there's often a problem on boards when you have very tall connectors, you know, terminal blocks, that kind of thing. Um, so you can get to them and that's quite handy. In terms of connectivity, what's on each tile? Well, you've got 12 FPGA digital IOs on each tile, eight of which are differential in nature and can handle differential signals, uh, four of which are just standard IOs. They're as fast as the FPGA is and the routing uh, will allow. There's also two mix signals uh, from the STM32, so that allows you to do two ADCs or you can use them as general purpose I IOs. You've got high power, so you've got the power distribution network taking power, high power and high current uh, onto the board. You've also got five volt and three volt three on the tiles. Um, and you've got a few control pins as well, such as reset um, and enable. And I think there's an interrupt on each tile, if I remember from the top of my head. Um, you have the interchangeable um, nature of uh, the, the top board. So you can actually put on different solutions depending on what you might be targeting. Um, as I say, we'll have two different versions, one which is hyperbus based and one which is QSPY based. Um, but overall, you've got something that's got complete compact modularity. Um, and what we're working on now um, is really how we then lay the software on top and try and make that modular uh, as well. How long have I got, Richard? I can be timing myself. Um, what I want to switch over to now, assuming I've got time, is to take a look at um, some of the software. Are there any questions on the hardware front um, before I switch over to?
I don't see any questions in the chat if you want to carry on. I think I think you've just become muted, Al. How much time do I have, Richard? Uh, well, we're running. We can run till eight o'clock. So it's up to you how much time to leave for questions mm -hmm. at the end. Okay. Um, so I'll switch over now to the. Uh, other software. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah. Um, so let's look at the simplest case here. Let's just do a blinky. Now, one of the things that we're leading with here in terms of development, um, we do have backward support for a lot of the black ice um, software. So we still have the same method that is backward compatible with programming uh, on the, uh, sorry, synthesizing and putting your um, FPGA image onto the FPGA. That works exactly the same as it has done since Black Ice 2 through to MX, etc. Um, literally, if you have the bit image that you've created in, you know, the Ice Storm or the next PNR tools, the open source tools, that binary can then literally just be catted or copied, if you like, out to the appropriate serial device that appears when you connect the USB. So it still appears as that serial device. It also has the auto magic that looks for the header in the image that it recognizes to know that it's being programmed. So again, you can carry on using those tools that you were using before, you know, the combination of make files and Verilog, et cetera. But something we're trying to champion, championing at the moment is moving over to something called Amaranth. If you haven't heard of Amaranth, Amaranth is the new name for Enmigen, uh, which was the new version of Migen. Um, so we're champion, championing, sorry, couldn't get that one out, the use of uh, Amaranth, because we think from a modularity point of view and from an ease of use point of view, certainly for people coming into this, it's, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a much easier road to travel. Um, Verilog can be a bit of a challenge, particularly if you're coming from a programming black background. And we do have lots of people coming from <clears throat> both programming and embedded programming looking to use these tools. <clears throat> now, the advantage of uh, Amaranth is it's actually written in Python. So it's fairly easy to get your head around, you know, that kind of familiar syntax. What is perhaps less obvious is how that makes the FPGA work. So uh, if we look at this example here, and I can probably just zoom in on, make that a bit bigger. So here is kind of the, the simple example, if you like. So at the top here, I'm, I'm, I'm importing everything I need from Amaranth. Um, crucially here, what I'm doing is I'm pulling in all of the IO uh, definitions and resources that are required on this particular board. So if you're using a different board, not using the Black Edge NXT, but using, say, you know, one of Lattice's ice sticks or something simple, then this would look different because the name that you'd be importing would reflect that. Um, then what you always see is a class that is um, derived, if you like, or uh, extends um, in object-oriented terms, something called elaborable. Now, the way that this works is this program isn't going to run in your FPGA. This isn't about running Python in the FPGA. What this does is it creates a, uh, a logical structure using the open source tools in the background, which it can then serialize and send out uh, to the board. So the idea of this particular function here um, and this must be um, obviously created in an elaboratable class, is to actually go through that process of outputting the structure. And it's kind of self-referential -refer as well. So the Python that's behind the scenes here 
will actually examine the structures that you're creating in this class and work out what you mean uh, in terms of um, logical uh, primitives. And it will actually create those logical primitives. Um, it could either output, you know, a Verilog version of this, or it can output directly to the uh, version supported by the open source tool chains, you know, in a kind of JSON type format or uh, text files that describe the uh, various different elements that it's using within the FPGA. So let's just take a look at a simple one. The first thing that we're doing here is we're creating something called an LED. OK, I think you can guess what that is. And what we're doing here is everything has a platform. The platform really is provided. Um, there's an abstraction in the Amaranth library, but it's really talking about what we have up here. This is what provides the platform that dictates what this platform means in this case. And we're asking for a particular resource that's available in here. So I have a pin effectively uh, actually defined. Uh, in the uh, MyStorm boards for the ICE logic bus, which is the FPGA part of uh, the solution. And it's called the LED. So all that's doing is pulling a single, you know, one bit LED pin out. And it's automatically doing that without me having to enter any pin numbers. In the same way that you pull in the name into a Verilog file that's declared somewhere in a PCF uh, kind of lookup file which defines the pin number and the name or label for it. The next thing we're doing is we're creating a timer, which is really a 24 bit wide uh, signal. And all we're going to do here is we're going to uh, increment that timer. Um, this will create a because we've got m.d.sync, this will create synchronous logic. What we're saying is add a synchronous piece of logic that increments the timer. Now, a synchronous piece of logic is really one that changes state on a clock edge. And by default, it will pick up what's defined in the boards file as your clock. So you don't even need to tell it that. It will take whatever the default platform is. So there's a clock that's fed into the FPGA from the microcontroller, and it will use that. It will use the edges of that clock to do the synchronous update of, in this case, it's a 24-bit timer register. Um, and here we have a combinational statement that is a non-synchronous thing. This is just like logic combinations, like a logical gate, like an AND or an OR, or a combination of those to make a more complex logical association. Um, and in this case, what we're saying is we're asking the LED to equal or become. It's a bit like an assign in Verilog. Um, and in this case, what we're saying is we're taking the most significant bit. Now, if you're into Python, you'll you, you'll realize that we're ac accessing effectively um, the last bit. Uh, one difference between Amaranth and Verilog is the bits around the wrong way. If you're used to one, you'll find that they're actually switched around, which is a bit confusing, to be honest. Um, and all of these are being built into this module. And you can have several modules and submodules, et cetera. And then what we're going to do is we're going to return that module object that has those combinational and uh, synchronous elements. And then Amaranth will know what to do with that. It will kind of build its own logical tree from this information that you've defined here. Uh, so my function here, synth, and that's not standard by any any means. I've just called it synth, and I quite often do this. Um, it doesn't have to be called that. But when, when I call this function, um, what it will do is it will load the platform. In this, this case, it's loading in the logic bus platform, which is what I've defined in the MyStorm boards file up here. It will then ask that to be built by the Amaranth tools. Um, and it's going to look for this particular top level class, Blink, that class that we just created, that elaborateable class. And then we've also got this nice little feature here, which says do program equal true. What that's saying is don't just build this locally, but also send it out to the FPGA board so that we can actually see it working. Um, which is another nice convenience. So you're not having to worry about dealing with the make files 
Um, you know, having to worry about things such as finding, oh, which serial port is it, you know, or, oh, bugger, I've just, you know, reprogrammed my keyboard instead of my FPGA because that came up as a serial port. Uh, and I do that regularly. Uh, and it's very annoying when it happens because suddenly you've lost a keyboard and you can't fix it very easily. You have to unplug, replug, et cetera. If you were to look in at the ICE Logic Board platform, which itself is written in Python, you'll see there is some code that actually takes care of that. It looks at the ports and it looks for the right uh, identifier um, so that it knows what to send that uh, that bit image or that FPGA image to. Um, and then the other one down below is really, if you're just running this on the command line, um, this is the standard Python sugar for automatically um, doing exactly what we're doing here. In fact, what I should do is really, that should just say, should just call synth, but yeah. So if I was to run that, what we would then see on the board, let me show you. Uh, so on here, um, you see, I've got the ST link processor because I'm actually running the firmware on here. I'll just have to lose the firmware for the microcontroller because the microcontroller acts as the uh, um the the middleman between the usb and the um and the um microcontroller which then talks and programs to the fpga and so if you see on that board there you'll see it's the same thing i showed you in the picture and if you look right down at the bottom right there you'll see that the uh there's a blue led flashing it's actually an rgb led but that pin happens to be connected to the blue part of that rgb led it's also a status led and it goes red if it, you program it incorrectly, for example, or if it's not not programmed. Um, when you program it, it actually flashes kind of amber and green. So it's very easy to do that. So if I was to run this now, Blinky, um, all I need to do is go to my run button in this case. I'm using PyCharm. I don't know what you would be using for your Python, but it's very easy. I just press run. And then you can see here what's actually happened. If I just enlarge this slightly. Here it's told me that it's found the device. Um, in this case, it's using the old names. As you can tell, the software is not finished. Um, it's found the device I'm running on Linux, which is why you see that path for the device. Then it says uploading to this device. Uh, then process finish with exit code zero. And it's happy. Um, I'll just enlarge this slightly. That might make it easier to see the interesting parts of that. Um, let me show you a more complicated one. So what happens if we go and use one of the use the LED blade, for example? So here it's a bit more complicated. Let me enlarge this so it's easier for you guys to um, to see. So again, we've got similar things at the top here the import the amaranth stuff and we're importing our board file and board library if you like um, here we've just got a it's basically a constant in this case although i'm not calling it constant that's just a single integer one um, because i want to tell it which blade to use because we've got several different blades so uh, we're then creating this resource um, now we're calling it LED blade. And what this is doing is this is taking the pin definitions of a blade, of which you can see six here. Uh, in this case, we're configuring them for output. Um, and that's the connector type that's defined in the um, uh, MyStorm boards. And this we're just using standard low voltage CMOS, three volt free CMOS, because we're configuring the IOs in this case um and we're picking up the signals that we need um we're calling this leds and this this sub signal is inside a resource called led6 it's a little confusing this syntax in amaranth um but it's a nice easy way of doing it but the key thing here is this value blade here that's taking the value one now if if that blade was in a different slot you know we might want to make that blade number two etc 
but the rest of our code would not need to change. We just change that number. It's very simple. So you've got that kind of modularity building up. Uh, if we look at the class again, it's elaborable, uh, elaborable. Uh, we, we're, we're grabbing the LEDs here. Um, we're, we're setting the default reset value uh, in this case. There are six LEDs on the board, so it's kind of six bits, if you like. We are then, um, yeah, this is a bit of uh, Python list comprehension for you. And it's just pull it, pulling out all of the LEDs that are listed in LED6. And it's cutting them together as a six-bit signal. We're then creating another timer signal, just like we did in the um, Blinky example. In, in this case, it's one bit less. It's 23 rather than 24. We're creating a module again. We're adding a synchronous piece to increment the timer. And then we're adding um, a conditional, um, which could be like a mux. That could be exploited as a mux, for example. And what it's saying here is if the timer, the MSB of the timer, if that's if that's Boolean true, or Amaranth true in this case, um, then what we're going to do is we're going to update the LEDs in this case. We're going to make them equal. Um, basically, this catted. And what that is is rotating the bits around. So I'm taking the bits from one end and putting it on the other end. And I'm actually inverting it. Well, don't worry too much about that. That's just a fancy way of doing something that looks nice. And if we look at the synth part, again, it's very similar. We're getting the ICE logic ball platform. And we're adding in the resource that we created up here, the LED blade, adding that into the platform. And then we're telling it to build. And again, we're using the class name here. That's what we want to build. And we're telling it to program. So now uh, when we build this, what we will get with any luck is some bladage LEDs. And there we see on the blade, we've got the LEDs flashing. And of course, if I move that into another position, um, I'm going to put that into position. Let me put that into position four. Of course, now, because it's still got the same image for uh, blade one, nothing is happening because it's trying to drive blade one, and blade one's not there. So if I go back, to the code and change that to uh, four. I save that and I run again. Now it is running, but in blade four, and all I've done there is I've changed the number. So that gives you that kind of lovely modularity. Uh, one more example. I think we've got time before questions. Um, something a bit more sophisticated. Uh, one of the things that we're working on to make this stuff uh, early, um, easier is we're trying to add in communication uh, tools between the STM32 microcontroller and the FPGA. We did do we did do some experimentation with this, and, and Richard, in fact, um, our host today, did some work work with the Arduino. So the STM32 could use an Arduino library to talk to the FPGA. Well, this is doing a very similar thing. Um, and what we're using is something that we, we call QSBI MEM or QSPI MEM, which itself is derived from something called SPI MEM, which was used on the Radiona.org ULX3S. It was originally developed by um, DMARD and also lots of here in the chat as well. And we just extended that because that supported SPI and we've just enabled it to support QSPI. Now, QSPI, uh, for those who, who can't remember or haven't heard of it, it's really a four bit serial interface rather than a two bit, uh, one bit. So you get a, a lot more uh, data transfer per clock cycle. So it's quite a quick mechanism. And in fact, this will go up to about 108 uh, megahertz, although we haven't got the FPGA to work anywhere near as fast as that yet because it hasn't been optimized. Um, so this will gives us a communication channel between the STM32 and the FPGA. And beyond that, we can also talk to it from the USB host. So we can actually create some Python um, on the PCB host that talks over this channel 
because it will recognize the difference between a serial communication uh, command that we're sending that transfers some information. Uh, it can differentiate that from being programmed. So assuming we write the right sort of uh, hardware description, the right kind of synthesis, we can put build in support, uh, which Laurie has done some work on, which you can include in your designs. That means that you can do things like you can send values to registers inside your um, synthesis running on the HDL, for example, or you can send information to a bus, like a wishbone bus or a peripheral on that wishbone bus later. So we've got a quick example here. Uh, I've just been conscious of the time. So in this case, again, what we're doing here is we're actually pulling in a tile resource rather than a blade, which is a seven segment in this case. Um, we're also bringing in a uh, phase lock loop because the clock coming into the FPGA is about 25 megahertz and we need to sample the QSPI at a much higher frequency. So we bang that up to about 100 megahertz using a phase lock loop. So we pull that in as a piece of code. We're also bringing in the Lorry's QSPI mem uh, HDL and we're bringing in the seven segment tile. Here we're saying we're going to use one of the blades. Um, and I better move that back because I've changed that position. Uh, I'll sort of remember, or as I forget, I wonder why it's not working. In blade one, we also have a tile, uh, which is the seventh and segment tile in uh, position three. Um, and in Laurie's case, he actually adds the PMOD. I'm not plugging the PMOD in this example case. That shouldn't be there. So we're creating the LED blade again. That's the same as before. Here we're creating Qbus 7 seg elaborateable um, HDL. So we're creating a QSPI. Uh, we're pulling in the QSPI connection between the two, uh, uh, the SCM32 and the FPGA, which is effectively six lines. Uh, we're connecting up the LEDs. We're getting the signals for the LEDs. And we're also going to use our little blinky LED as well, because we want to talk to all three of these. We're creating our module from which we can then create our HDL. Uh, we're defining what the clock frequency is because we need that to calculate uh, things in some cases. For example, if we want to run a UART, although we're not using it in this particular example. Um, we're uh, setting up the clock pin here, which we're getting from the platform as a default clock. We're calling in the phase lock loop, which is going to create our higher frequency 100 hertz at 100 megahertz clock, which we're going to use to do our synchronous work. So we're setting that on our domain to the new uh, phase lock loop frequency, so it samples higher, our synchronous domain. Um, and we're enabling, uh, and we're connecting up combinationally, um, like assigning the 25 megahertz into the PLL itself. And then we're uh, actually pulling that all together and making that, connecting that up so it works. We're then creating an instance, a sub-module called QSPI memory. And then we're connecting up some pins here. So these are the QSPI memory pins. You'll see that there's a select pin, a clock pin, and then we've got the uh, uh, interrupt pin, uh, which we're not using in this sample. And then we've got uh, an output and an output enable pin because it's a bi-directional, it's a half duplex bus, unlike SPI. So we need to be able to control the input and output. We're then adding in the seven segment tile. Um, we are getting a display register signal, which is a 12 bit signal, which we're gonna use to buffer the information coming in and connect up to the data output on the various different display devices. Um, so we're setting up uh, our seven segment pins. So we're getting those in from the platform, from the tile. We're setting up, uh, we're um, actually taking those pins and creating a eight bit uh, signal from the individual pins in the order that we want. And then combinationally, we're connecting up um, the LED with that, those seven segment signals. We're also connecting the uh, signal pins that control the digits. Uh, if you look at the um, this device, you'll find that there's actually three digits. So we need to enable those successively. And that's what these uh, these pins are do, 
and that will scan through so it can display each digit at a time uh, and then we're connecting up the uh, value that's driving those digits to the display itself and in this case what it's doing it's going to look at the QSPI mem write signal and when it sees that that is address value zero because there's a protocol underneath here of the information that's been transferred over QSPI mem. So when that write line is active and we see the address zero, we say, oh, well, this is obviously designed for our um, display. So it loads in the value of that transfer uh, synchronously on the clock. Um, we then, what we can also do is we can actually take out you know, a higher value of that address. So when it's addressed to the next byte, for example, because what's going to happen here is we're sending bytes successively uh, through the memory and we're incrementing those bytes as we're going through them. So on this byte here, what we're doing is we're connecting it out. And what we're actually doing is we're just taking um, four of the signals, uh, four bits of the signal, and we're displaying that on the eight bits of the display line because we need eight bits to drive the seven segments and but it can be encoded as a four bit binary that's what's going on here um, <clears throat> and then the final one is we're taking you know the the other value the final value and we're using that to control the state of the led so what we're saying is the top uh the most significant byte we're using to drive the blink LED and the six uh, bits below that are being used to drive the blade LEDs. And then quite simply, what we do here is we load the platform again. We add the resources that we've created in here. We do the build and then what we do is we set the address to zero. We set up some data that we want to send to it from Python. We then create the command in a specific structure. So the O3 command means write over the QSPI memory. We convert the address that we've created here to bytes, uh, big endian. Um, we also add the length of data to that, the number of bytes that we're transmitting. Uh, again, big endian plus the data. We then say we're sending the command and then using the platform the milestone platform we actually send that information over that then gets handled by the stm32 which forwards it on over the qspi mem bus to the actual uh, fpga which has just been synthesized by this operation so we've got the entire thing going on all in one very simple um one simple um python file so if i now run this Hopefully, what will happen is it's Cuba 7 seg. So if I run this now, what well, hopefully we should see. There we go. So what we see there is 642. So if you look at the code, the bytes that we're sending, it's a strange order, and I apologize for that. Um, but those are the digits that we're sending, and the 38 gets converted into this binary code. Um, this bit controls the uh, LED that's blinking, the blue LED, um, which is on. You can't see it because my hand's in the way. And the blades, which are controlled by these bits. As you see, it's difficult to hold this without my hands is in the way of the various different things, and you can see on the blade. At the two lower LEDs, the green ones and the amber one are on, which is these three digits. In fact, those are the top, not the lower. Sorry. Voila! And that is my um, demonstration. I know it was a bit rushed in the end. Um, and I think we've got five minutes for questions. Questions, Richard. And I need a drink. That was quite a presentation, thank you. It's really interesting to see how things have evolved from over the years since the, the first My Storm appeared.
I'm fascinated by the by your use of uh, micro um, SD connectors as general purpose connector. Is is yeah. that your is that your invention, or have you seen that done? It is. Elsewhere? I, I, did actually, I did actually think about this some time ago, Richard, and thought one day I'm going to do it, and then I just kind of suddenly thought, oh well, why not do it now? Just to complicate things a bit more. But it's a kind of fun thing. They're great little fun things, you know, to make. You know, and if you want something small like an accelerometer or some LEDs or something like that, something that doesn't necessarily need connectors, although we do have a kind of um, this one, for example, this is a, an OLED type connector. So that's got the blade on the end, and a little FPC connector, and then that in turn uh, drives a small OLED display. Or in fact, this one's the you know, a 1.3 inch, I think, IPS color LCD. Uh, and six pins is just right for doing, you know, SPI LCDs, you know, and OLEDs. So, yeah, you've got to be careful though. You don't want to put big connectors on them. You know, from a clinical point of view, they're uh, slightly less robust. And if you've got a big connector hanging off them, you're going to cause yourself problems. But they're great. If you want to put like an accelerometer on one, some LEDs or something like an OLED. They're perfect for that sort of thing. One of the things that we're working on is doing a um, ESP32, uh, like a, the RISC V C3 version of the ESP32, having one of those on a blade so that you've got Wi Fi as well. Um, but there are endless different things that you could do, you know, on the blades or the micro blades. Yeah, it makes a, a lovely um, compact connector, and but it's it's quite mechanically robust as long as, as you say, as long as you don't as long as you keep it too small. heavy on the outside. Yeah, and simple, then then they're good. Yeah, and I tell you what else you can use them for is like USB-I memory and flash. That kind of works as well. So with with flash on it, it's really a, yet another form of SD card you've just created. Yeah, you could create your own, hmm. <laughs> or you could just use an SD card. <laughs> they fit right. Uh, uh, this I'm not sure when we're shipping. By the way, uh, we've got out there at the moment. Um, Including mine, got three units out there with very keen developers, people like Laurie and some others uh, who are doing some work on this and helping me, you know, do useful stuff for this rather than just um, shipping it empty kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we're still trying to get some of the documentation done and things like that as well, so it's ready. And we've made some, I've made some changes to the hardware as well, which we've got new PCBs coming for. Um, but it's going to be ready to ship. I've just got to get them made and get this documentation done. So it's going to be in the next month or so. Hopefully that we'll actually be putting them out there to um, everyone else. Lots of people will be looking forward to that. Um, this is the open source um, specialist group. I, I need to ask you whether you're continuing your tradition of, of doing all this in the open and, and putting board hardware design files and software Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's all open source. Um, probably the best place to start is, let me just switch back to here. Uh, I, don't if I, can, I don't know if I committed the change. I did add a link. Uh, there we go. Oh, it's reloading all the files. Give me a sec. There's the link there. If you uh, actually, this is called Black Edge NXT. I haven't renamed the repository yet. It's still got the old name on it. But if you go there, um, that has all of the hardware design for the uh, the system board, the board on the top. But it also links to the other repositories, such as the FPGA part of the board and to the tiles section, et cetera. Not all the tiles have been loaded up yet. They will all get loaded along with the documentation. Um, it also links to things like Black Crab, 
which is the name of the firmware because that's written in Rust. That's why it's called Black Crap. You know, crap stuff. The Rust. What, what's his name? I forget what his name is. The uh, the crab in Rust. He's got a name. The crustacean. But um, uh, the other place you can get us and come and discuss it as well is you go down to Discord. There's a link there. Um, come join us and talk with us down on Discord uh, and find out what's going on and get involved as well. But yeah, it's, the whole thing's open source. All the firmware, uh, all the Python code, all the Arint code, all the HDL and the examples that we're all working on, that's all open source. Uh, all the documentation is going to be in Markdown, so it's accessible and people can change it. And then all the hardware is obviously, you know. Uh, most of it's currently in Eagle. We are doing kind of, we are importing some of it into KiCad. We are starting to use KiCad in some areas as well. Um, but yeah, completely open source, as we like it, as it should be. That's, that's great. It means that even us uh, software people who aren't going to make our own boards can go and look at the design files if we have any questions about how things work and it's all there we can see for ourselves what's how what's all there and how it works yeah i can't see any other questions coming up um julian if you're still there you could just uh, finish the recording <laughs>